Hey, this is Scott Townsend, and I'm glad to announce that we've got two new subscribers to the show, Pops Daylight Donuts and Castafly Outdoor Adventures. Uh, the first one, Pops Daylight Donuts, man, they've got the best tasting donuts, sausage wraps, pastries in Northeast Oklahoma. And also, if you'll tell the staff there, hey, Scott Townsend said to give me a large spicy pig, they'll give you a free large spicy sausage wrap. But you have to tell them Scott Townsend sent you. So tell them, hey, Scott Townsend told me to tell you to give me a large spicy pig. So there's the offer. There's the, there's the call to action. So go to Pops Daylight Donuts. Say hi to Mark for me. And uh, yeah, go to Pops Daylight Donuts and get you some. The other sponsor is Castafly Outdoor Adventures. Adventure, that's where it begins. We look to create and document our moments in time while embracing the majestic wonder and beauty of the great outdoors. Our quest is to explore the back roads of the Ozarks, camping, fishing, and just getting lost. Refresh your spirit and join us on our next adventure. Paul and his crew invite you to subscribe to the Castafly Outdoor Adventures YouTube channel. Welcome to the Scott Townsend Show, brought to you by Dietzo Man Productions. Hey, this is Scott Townsend, and you're joining the Scott Townsend Show. And today I have with me special guest Robert Bryce. Robert is in Austin, Texas. He's an author, journalist, filmmaker, podcaster. Um, there's not a lot you don't do, is there? Uh, I also do the grocery shopping and most of the cooking here for my <laughs> wife, who's very proud of her. She's a teacher and she works really hard. So, oh yeah, she, I, we kind of switched roles on that, which has been fun for me. So yeah, I, all good. I'm a, I'm a lucky man. So for 30, over almost 30 years now, you've been, well, here's your latest book, uh, A Question of Power. Uh, you've been talking, writing, discussing about uh, power. Uh, your podcast, Power Hungry, and your uh, film, which is your movie, your documentary, which is on the TV show, TV behind you there, Juice, uh, How Electricity Explains the World. Um, the reason why I had you on, and, and just so everybody knows, uh, Robert and I have worked in the past. He was a keynote speaker to one of the uh, conferences I produced. And did a fantastic job. Everybody was super pleased with it. Uh, as an event planner, you know, you, you always sweat that when you hire a keynote speaker, you want them to do great. And uh, in this case, uh, it was a home run. So I really uh, appreciated that. Well, glad to glad to be on with you, Scott. And, I'm, you know, as I think, you know, I, I was blacked out for 45 hours during the blizzard last month. And uh, it's uh, terrible that we had a blizzard, but, uh, you know, good for me in a certain way. And that people suddenly look around and say, hey, this electricity stuff matters. So, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, don't wish a blizzard like this, a deadly blizzard no. like this on anybody, but it's underscoring. And I think what's interesting in the wake of the blizzard here in Texas is that it's no longer you could just say, oh, those crazy Californians and they mismanage their grid and, you know, they're, you know, eating quinoa and doing yoga over there and not paying attention to business. Well, maybe we were eating barbecue and, and uh, you know, whatever else, chicken fried steak here and weren't paying attention either. So uh, it's been uh, a real wake up call. I think my bottom line is it's a wake up call to the, understand the this the, the electric grid is the most important network in our society. It is the mother network upon which all of our other networks depend. And we, and we ignore that importance at our peril. We had this uh, tremendous uh, power outage, uh, severe temperatures all through the Midwest. Texas hadn't seen anything like it in probably 80, 100 years. I had actually had a friend of mine, uh, Trey Tay. Uh, he's been on this podcast before, and he predicted, he wrote on LinkedIn, there's one thing he said, um, he was talking about the models continue to move cooler for a huge chunk of the country. Outdoor activities should become difficult or not, if not dangerous. Uh, he predicted nine or 10 days without getting above freezing. And he was just telling everybody to be careful. And when I saw that, I thought, well, that's, you know, that's good. Not, that was nice of him to do that. But uh, then it hit. And then, oh my gosh. And what, we, and what we, happened? and we, and we had six consecutive days under uh, uh, sub-freezing temperatures here 
in Austin. And I've lived in Austin now for 35 years. Um, and I've never seen anything like it. And we had uh, eight inches of snow or so at our house. You know, I think one of the things that is the takeaway for me from this, Scott, in, and writing about now the energy business, I've published six books on the energy business, been following it, writing about it for 30 years, is not only is the grid central to everything that we do, and it is central to uh, our entire ways of life and, and our, you know, our economy, but we need fuel security. And that means diversity. And so for me, during the middle of the blackout, and I had a piece in Forbes that, you know, I was it got a fair amount of traction. To me, energy security means having enough firewood in the in the house, having a natural gas connection. And which, you know, if we hadn't had natural gas, that would have meant no hot food, no hot coffee, no hot water. And, and we would have likely had to leave our home. And but we had natural gas. So the, the among the many punchlines, and we can get to some of the, the others, is that this idea that we should electrify everything, including all of our heating, all of our cooking, all of our hot water heating, clothes drying, everything is a recipe for disaster. I mean, a total disaster. And, and yet that is the agenda being pushed by some of the biggest environmental groups in America. And it's a deeply, deeply dangerous concept or deeply dangerous vision. Um, and I would even say a, kind of a fever dream, but yet they're pushing this as part of the climate change agenda. And my response is, yes, climate change is a concern. It's not the only concern. And energy security has to rank above that, uh, that issue of, of climate change. It just has to. Otherwise, thousands of people will die, maybe tens of thousands of, of hypothermia. I mean, uh, you, being secure in the winter means having enough energy to assure that you don't freeze to death. And right. that was where we were uh, here in Texas for a lot of people. And, and so anyway, I'm getting all worked up again because it, no, it really right. did really did uh, change my view on these ideas about energy, energy security, energy availability and energy policy. And yet we see this, the new Biden administration, and I'm not partisan. I, I just think their agenda is just just wrongheaded. So they're the electric companies, the the corporations or whatever, are trying to convince everybody to put all their eggs in one basket. Sounds like. Well, I don't know that it's even the utilities trying to do this because I think that it's what the the charge is being led by the the usual suspects and the Sierra Club. They're keeping track of all the communities in California that have banned natural gas, and there are something like forty one or forty two of them now. Uh, most all of which, are, by the way, have household incomes far above the statewide average in California. You've seen the city of Seattle also ban the use of natural gas in future construction. You have a dozen communities in the state of Massachusetts now that are attempting to implement these kinds of bans. Um, and and uh, one of the things that's essential to understand about these bans is that by restricting the use of natural gas, they will force more home heating load onto the electric grid with heat pumps, which are terrible, they're then they're worse during extremely cold weather. So you're going to have higher winter peak demand for electricity. Uh, and and what happens if you have an extended blizzard and the grid goes down? Well, people will freeze. And I, I just think that I have this old idea that you know people should matter and they should matter a lot, and and policymakers should take that into consideration, but. We're in the midst of a craze, an all-out craze, and it is being funded by tens of millions of dollars from uh, Michael Bloomberg's foundation, from the Bezos Earth Fund, and this is the state of play. It seems like uh, when I was growing up, you probably remember this too. I never remembered blackouts, brownouts. We never had to do without uh, electricity. Um, growing up. And now it almost seems like we're in a third world country in our own country here, because now we're having uh, rolling blackouts. Uh, we had rolling blackouts here during the ice, uh, d during that cold uh, snap. Uh, yeah. My nephew down in Houston, uh, they, they, they shut their, the whoever shut their power off. Right. So they had to go to another friend's house to stay warm. Well, when they came back, guess what? The pipes in the ceiling froze and flooded the whole house. So yeah. it, it, it it's just it's crazy. It's it's been a cascading, and what I think this one of the things that this blizzard proved was 
once the electric power goes off, it starts affecting all the other networks in the society. The water distribution system here in Austin, uh, one of the biggest water treatment plants in the, in the city lost power. And it, now, the, I, whether this was because of ERCOT, uh, the Electric Reliability Council of Texas mistakenly shutting it off or something else, I don't know. But no one at the power at the water plant knew how to turn on the emergency generators. Well, that's kind of a problem. But so you lose power, well, then you lose water. And then for homeowners, if you're losing power and you don't have any heat and you don't have any way to keep the water flowing, your pipes break. Well, then you have a cascading system of failures that are incredibly expensive. I mean, we're all, I've seen estimates in Texas, the overall economic losses at $129 billion. I mean, these are staggering numbers. And Yes, it was cold and damn cold for a long time. But it, it, the other punchline, I think, is we spent way too much time and attention on decarbonization and not enough on resilience and reliability. So in your article in Forbes uh, recently, you talked about the low income, middle income folks getting getting hit with. I mean, I, this is just this just is blowing my mind. The uh, amounts of uh, their electric bills for even just for, you know, maybe a day or so. Being right. in the thousands and thousands, you mentioned nine thousand dollars for in one right. instance. I, yeah. I, just, I just can't even compute. I mean, who would have thought that was? Why is that? Well, it's a function of the way the market was structured. That you would have what are called retail electric providers, who are just pop up companies that really have very few assets. They don't own any generators. They don't own any poles or any wires. They essentially have a mailbox, uh, a post office box and some stamps, and they are the ones who, in theory anyway, are providing the electricity. Well, they're not providing anything. They're except they're, they're a, a front for uh, generators or a middleman, I guess would be the right way to put it, that then buys generation, buys power from the, the generators and then pays the transmission companies to move it and then they collect the money and then pay back the transmission company and the generators. So it's, it, 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 it created this deregulation of the system created an extraordinarily complex system. And now what we're finding is that by creating this extraordinarily complicated system, the buck doesn't stop anywhere. What, uh, what role do you think green regulation uh, played in the Texas debacle, ICE debacle? Well, I wouldn't use the word green regulation. What is apparent to me is that there was excessive funding and excessive attention given to renewable generation over reliable generation. So the, the way the system was set up, it incented a lot of construction of wind and solar. And I was, in fact, I did a, I did a recorded a podcast this morning um, with uh, Bill Peacock, who's an expert on the Texas grid. He said that since, uh, was it in the last five years in Texas, installed generation capacity, gas was up, natural gas fire generation was up 3.5%. Wind was up 113% and solar went up 2000%. So you have a situation where essentially all of the investment over the past few years went into unreliable sources of generation and not to reliable, resilient generation. So this idea that somehow, and it's been repeated in the press many, many times, oh, the natural gas didn't show up. Natural gas actually performed heroically. Wind and solar went missing. So do you think the government should be in the power production business? Well, like it or not, I think that the, the government is in, you know, involved in the marketplace all around. What I'd answer it this way, Scott, which is that it's clear to me that the government, government, state government in Texas and individual governments within the state, again, have paid too much attention to renewables and not enough to the forms of energy that proved their value during the depths of the crisis. And that in particular is nuclear energy. I'm adamantly pro-nuclear. My view is you're anti-carbon dioxide and uh, and, uh, and, and anti-nuclear, you're pro-blackout. Well, I am adamantly now, after 45 hours in the dark, I am adamantly anti-blackout. But the nuclear generation fleet in Texas, which consists of just four reactors, two at Comanche Peak and two at South Texas Project, 
they perform better than any other form of generation. And this has been proven over and over again, that during blizzards, nuclear plants perform better than any other form of generation. So why aren't we building more of it? And the answer is because the, the, uh, I want to bring up the Sierra Club again, they're adamantly opposed. They're trying, still trying to aim at closing the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant in California. In New York, Natural Resources Defense Council and others are forcing the closure of Indian Point, the single most important source of generation for the city of New York. So it, it's a compounding series of errors in terms of policy and imagination, I think, that is leading us down a perilous road. So if the Sierra Club is so bent on getting these things shut down, is there another club that's trying to help prop these things up and keep them going? <laughs> Do we need to well, start a club? Maybe so. I don't know <laughs> what the name of the club is. Um, <laughs> but I think that it's clear that, you know, you're familiar with the oil and gas industry. I'm somewhat familiar with it as well. For years, they had kind of a dominant position. They had more money. They had more influence. That's not, that's not the case anymore. The money and the influence is all on the green or, or on the renewable side of the ledger. They have all the money and all the all the the the, the political not all most of the they are they they have far more money. They have far more sympathy among the media outlets, and um, they have a lot of momentum. And so, as the uh, struggle uh, continues between the forces, we've got uh, people freezing to death in their own beds in Texas, which is just. Absolutely hard to imagine. Sixty-year-old couple froze to death in their uh, living room, and a, what an infant uh, froze in their uh, crib. And it's just that's Texas. That's not Texas. I'm from Texas, you know. And you can't that, that thing can't, that can't happen in Texas. And it, it, it shouldn't. It, it shouldn't happen. And it's and it's it's the kind of thing that should deliver a huge wake-up call to policymakers to understand. You monkey around with this grid at your extreme peril, and yet that's what we've seen is a is a is a very cavalier attitude toward resilience and reliability. Too much focus on decarbonization and not enough on resilience and reliability. I heard that uh, foreign governments supply a large percentage of our electrical power generation equipment and control systems that have designed vulnerabilities to be exploited for control and political gain. Is that, have you heard of that? Is that? I, I don't know that I believe that. I, I mean, you know, there's been some of the talk around Huawei, what is it, Huawei and their 5G, you know, equipment. Uh, what I know from my own limited, albeit limited experience, some of these, uh, the, the big suppliers in the United States of, of equipment for the grid are American. Um, but you know, I, I, I understand the concern about foreign components. Um, and I also understand the, the, the concern about having a supply chain that is an American supply chain so that in case of disruption, in case of conflict, in case of, uh, you know, the, the, the poop really hitting the fan, that the United States won't have to rely on foreign supply chains. And I think that that's one of the other key things to keep in mind here is that these renewable generation technologies um, are heavily dependent on Chinese supply chains, particularly for rare earth elements, uh, uh, neodymium, praseodymium, lanthanum. Uh, these are critically sometimes called the green elements. They're the, um, the, the, among what, what a group called the lanthanides. China uh, has overwhelmingly dominate, is overwhelmingly dominating that market, depending on who you believe, 78 to 80% of the global supply. So it, it's not just the components of, you know, the control systems, the SCADA systems, et cetera. It's the actual elements that go into the uh, neodymium iron boron magnets in the Prius. It's, it's these other elements that go into the critical materials, as well as polysilicon, uh, which is, of course, needed for solar panels. And some of the latest news out of the solar sector is that a, a, a significant portion of that polysilicon is being um, sourced out of Xinjiang in Western China, where the Chinese government uh, has been actively repressing the Uyghurs. So the idea that American solar panels or solar panels being used in America are somehow dependent on slave labor in China, well, how is that an improvement over what we have? It's not. It's a. It's a real. Should be a real concern. And again, another part of the wake up call. 
So what can people do if they're, if they're afraid to open their electric bill and, uh, <laughs> and, and they do, is there help? I mean, I, I can't believe that these people are just, and you mentioned that it's lower income, middle income folks that are already on a good day struggling to, you know, right. pay the right. electric bill and water bill. Yeah. And yeah. So now well, <clears throat> what, what, what do you do? Well, this is one of the things that's going to be the most difficult to resolve is that this energy burden as the, uh, the term of art in that, in that, in the people who study energy poverty, this energy burden is already very significant for uh, hundreds of thousands of people in Texas. It's not just limited in Texas. Energy poverty is a problem all across the country and around the world. And that was one of the things, key messages in my movie, Juice, How Electricity Explains the World, um, which, by the way, is on the Roku channel. You can watch it for free. You can watch it on Amazon Prime. It's available on Google Play, on iTunes. YouTube, uh, iTunes. Um, and my book, Juice, How Electricity Exp or, or, or A Question of Power, Electricity and the Wealth of Nations, available at all fine booksellers. <laughs> There are yeah. 3 billion people in the world today who use less electricity than an average American refrigerator. So this issue of energy poverty is not an American issue. It's not a Texas issue. It's a global issue. But to your question about the people who are facing big, uh, big electric bills, this is one of the thorniest issues. And, I, and I, I think it's already clear that in the wake of the Texas blackouts, the costs of, the, of recovering from this are going to be felt more by the energy burden will be felt more by low and middle income people. Well, for more information about uh, what you can do, find out more about the electric grid and how uh, electricity has something to do with everything. You like check out Robert's book, A Question of Power. Uh, I'm going to definitely check out Juice on uh, iTunes or on uh, no, Amazon Prime. Uh, Amazon Prime. And then you've got your uh, Power Hungry podcast. Uh, there's a lot of ways to find out about what Robert's talking about here. And, uh, and you, really can find most, you can find most of it at robertbryce.com. If you're trying to find me on the, on the interweb, on the Google, uh, robertbryce.com. I'm on Twitter, uh, at Power Hungry, PWR Hungry. The film on Twitter is, uh, is at Juice for All, and on the web, the movie is juicethemovie.com. So uh, if you search for me, you will find me. It won't be hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate your time and your lending your expertise and uh, extreme knowledge on this topic and uh, thoughts and prayers out to the Texans out there uh, going through. Still not over yet, but uh, they'll, they'll get through. They always do. Yeah. And, uh, any last words? No, well, I appreciate it, Scott. I'm glad to reconnect with you. And, uh, you know, uh, I'll hope to be back in Oklahoma sometime soon. I haven't been up there for a long time to see my family because, well, you know, it, it was, <laughs> we had the, <laughs> the coronavirus wasn't enough. Then we had to have Correct. a blizzard and a blackout. And uh, so it's been uh, been a little difficult to stay connected with people in general, but especially my, my family in Oklahoma. And I love Tulsa and I love coming back to Oklahoma, but I'm going to be up there pretty soon, I'm sure. The hits just keep on coming. Well, <laughs> Robert, this is Scott Townsend. Thanks for joining the Scott Townsend Show. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you later. Thank you, sir. Scott Townsend Show is a Deeds O Man production. For more episodes, visit the Scott Townsend Show YouTube channel, listen on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Scott.